Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can join the YouTube channel directly at multiple levels, even $1 a month, and or maybe preferably head over to aksum.substack.com or patreon.com slash aksum, you know the deal. Today's special guest is a returning guest, Diakonos Alamasilasi, and Dethna. Um, we have had a series of conversations about the Andimta on this channel with you in English and in Amharic, and I appreciate that today we'll continue in English perhaps another day. In Amarinya, I know that you're excited because your book is complete on your end and we are all eagerly awaiting its publication and when it is published we will direct people to it so that they can go and cop that in the meantime today we want to discuss the literature review and some of the the main points inside of it just as kind of a refresher for my audience to make this somewhat standalone in case they haven't seen your previous episodes which they should go check out could you just tell my audience again, like a general view of what Andimta is and what the role of a literature review is? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Andimta is a Amharic commentary on the um, Bible and uh, other liturgical uh, and, and monastic and patristic texts. Um, it is Amharic commentary on his text. Um, it is a medieval uh, Amharic uh, dated to around the 16th century. The, uh, the literature is dated to have developed around that time. Um, Andimta, the word itself, comes from uh, the style of exegesis uh, where uh, commentary, additional commentary is provided step by step uh, and introduced as on dim as so as to say there is also another interpretation uh and so the um th that that style of commentary that takes the the name that we uh, uh call it the uh, on dim top is uh, that's where it comes from uh and the role of a literature review is uh when you are uh writing a dissertation you uh, put together a review of all the literature on that field of uh, research um, to point out what has been done and to show uh, where you are going to contribute. Very good. And so your field is this biblical commentary in Amharic and in, as I think we talked about it, and you talked about a little bit actually about the kind of the age is, is medieval. In your best uh, educated guess, because from, from your writing, there's a portion that they memorize the text itself, and then there's the part where they interpret it. Obviously, there's really like Oxumite evidence or evidence back into the, you know, I don't know, 600s or 700s. Uh, I think at least the 600s, as far back as the 600s of just retention of the biblical texts, things like the gospel, the Garima gospels, things like the Proverbs and, and various Psalters. But what's the kind of oldest evidence we have for the interpretation part of that? Uh, uh, real quick, I think the Garima gospels are dated to around 300, right? Yeah. Yeah, they, they give a range for them. So um yeah four, fourth to seventh i don't think they have it precisely down yeah i would love it for that to be the final answer 300s and it would make sense with sort of the organized structure of christianity in ethiopia or aksum at the time um, but i have some i've seen some people say a little later and obviously people have different biases and and different means of dating texts yeah uh so uh the uh, Andamta uh, manuscript evidence uh, points to about the 1600s. Uh, the literary evidence uh, beyond the manuscript evidence, the literary evidence uh, uh, solidifies that uh, the worldview 
the 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 references the language is uh 1500s 1600s uh but also we have to remember that there was an earlier commentary tradition before the andimta in that uh i i'm not exactly sure about the manuscript um evidence and dating i've seen manuscripts that are from the 1500s uh, but uh, nothing a whole lot earlier than that but that's just i haven't necessarily seen every uh uh um manuscript that exists out there or anything but you know uh, those um seem to uh predate it slightly but not necessarily um by more than you know 300 or 400 years or whatever yeah that's um that it's very interesting i don't know what you make of it i could have my own you know guesses but whether it's an educated guess or or speculative do you think it's just that we lack evidence and the more we excavate we may find older and uh, older commentaries in that is to is tradition or do you think like committing it uh, an interpretation like that to writing as opposed to having it, you know, spoken or something. Because we assume people were preaching and teaching. It's the material, like uh, I suspect uh, uh, that the material evidence um, was uh, pretty much destroyed um, in, in totality by the uh, by the uh, uh, the wars of Ahmed uh, Grang. Um, the Andimta, it looks like to me, and I've written in my uh, 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 research also that the Andimta looks like it's just a response to the destruction. Wow. Uh, it's, it's a recovery. Uh, it's a recovery phase um, that seems to have begun around Galaudios, uh, Emperor Galaudios. Um, and I've looked at his chronicles, Azi Galaudios Zena Mu'al, and um, uh, I have uh, I've I've put that in my research because it does look like that the Andimta itself is a response to the destruction, and so um, it's not surprising that you don't find much uh, of the earlier commentary tradition, the Tirugwami, uh, and it, it it you know the, the word Tirugwami we, we we use it uh, sporadically, but what, what I'm saying here Tirugwami the more ancient version of the commentary tradition before the Andimta. Uh, I don't know that we should suspect uh, that we will be able to find uh, a whole lot. We have already found a, you know, a, a good amount, it, but I think the liturgical tradition itself embodied the uh, interpretive tradition. So forget about biblical commentary. I think the uh, liturgical rites and the um, especially Saint Yared's compositions pretty much served as the uh, hermeneutic body because Saint Yared is interpreting in his um, compositions the scriptures uh, to a great extent. I mean, it, it, it's a vast um, response to the scriptural message, and it's in the it's in the Dugwa, it's in the Zoma Dugwa, it's in the Miraf, etc. And I think that's where a lot of the understanding of uh, the scriptures and of just the uh, the it, it, within the liturgy, the resp the understanding of scriptures were just there in musical format. That's that's a theme that I bring up a lot when I teach people, and you. Uh, it's a good segue too, because we're going to get into the players in your field, but. I believe it's Ralph Lee who draws upon those connections between the way in which through liturgical and through hymnography means you get an interpreter or a teacher in St. Yarid and relating that to perhaps some of the things that St. Ephraim and of uh, the Syrian and Jacob of Sarug would have been famous for doing in the Syriac tradition. But could you just tell us who some of the major players in this field have been in the English language? Because a question I always get is, all right, Henok, thank you. You told us all this cool stuff, but is it just all trapped in Gutes? Like, is there anything for us to read in English? Do we have any access? Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and uh, okay, so uh, but let me filter. Let me filter the uh, content because there are two main types of 
scholarly works on uh, the Ethiopian commentary tradition. And I think the most important has been primarily Roger Cowley and second in second in place uh, I would I would say his sister Peterson uh Mahoy uh um who lived in the Ethiopian community Cowley also lived with the Ethiop with the Ethiopian community um for a few decades so uh the they had grafted themselves into the uh religious society that they were uh, writing about besides them there are critical editions there's people out there that are uh, philologists uh, or um, researchers of language ancient languages and literatures who uh, translate some of the texts uh, and that is not the same thing that Cowley was doing Cowley was doing a lot uh, and he laid the foundations uh, between the late 60s and the uh, mid 80s he laid the foundations for the uh, scholarly study of Ethiopian biblical of Ethiopian biblical commentary tradition and he did that by looking and uh, uh, engaging in many different kinds of studies biographical studies um, literary studies uh, uh, tracing sources where 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 some of these commentaries translated from etc and then he engages in most studies of um, biblical uh, motifs, um, themes, theological points, um, hermeneutic questions. So I don't like to put that on the same level as uh, the, the critical editions. Um, the trans people that are translating the text, that's one thing, that's data. Uh, and, and particularly now in our day and age, the data that is coming out of the uh, field of Ethiopian studies um it has to be there, there's there's a paraphrasing that needs to happen uh because the method methodology um that those people that are translating these things engage in uh, has to be put under question um there because there is a i don't like to put the data on the same scale as the engaging in the theological and literary work of 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 the texts uh, and primarily because not just because the data is just data uh, it's not put together it's not synthesized um, there's no rumination that really occurs there's no contribution to uh, the uh, the thinking that goes on within the, li the literary composition itself it doesn't match it's just where did this come from who translated it and uh, there's a lot of uh, reductive fallacy philosophically. There's a reductive fallacy that goes on where uh, explaining where something comes from, uh, it, it, where the translations were of these texts, explaining where they come from and where they're translated from does not uh, reduce the value of uh, literature. And this, um, this trend actually uh, exist, existed I don't know if it exists still. It existed in biblical studies prior, um, uh, and uh, it. I think it ceased for the most part because uh, it is not very solid uh, as a as a methodologically within itself. Uh, it's kind of a mimicking of the scientific method, uh, and it's and I I, from what I see in in certain fields, it's died out. But so. I like to be very clear uh, that I don't put the two on the same on the same uh, scale. At the end of the day, my my research is uh, focused on a study of the biblical literature, uh, and then secondarily a study of the Ethiopian history um, and biographical. Uh, 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 information that you find in the Andamta, which is it's very hard to find biographical information within the Andamta. Uh, it's like uh, doing it's like doing a murder investigation. <laughs> the, the Andamta names about within the whole corpus of the Old Testament and the New Testament commentary. 
it names about four people in passing and gives you almost no information on them. Uh, some of them, some of those names, for example, uh, are uh, Masafakan. Well, we don't know who that is. What well, we do, we'll get to that I, when we look at the literature review. Um, Sidi Paulos, who was a foreigner, um, uh, and who's who's not only mentioned. Um, it's interesting because when engaging in Andamtai, there's some huge hurdles, and some of those hurdles are linguistic. You need a, a very good command of Giz, and then you need an excellent command of Amharic just to begin. And then the Amharic particularly is an old Amharic, they call it. It's medieval I would, I, in, in my perspective and in a lot of other people. But it originally, I think, Professor Gita Chohaili and, and uh, Roger Cowley uh, called it old Amharic. And um, that's just to begin. Now, after you begin, what you soon realize is that you have to have a good understanding of the breadth of literature within the Ethiopian tradition. Of the, You have to have seen a good amount of the monastic texts, of the patristic texts. Uh, you have to be uh, familiar with the liturgy and so on. Because the, the citations within Andamta will never tell you where something is located. It quotes something, and it quotes it in Giz, and of course it assumes you know where it is because though the students of Andimta were, uh, uh, it's were, were those in the final and and highest stages of education in the Ethiopian Church, uh, where a lot of things, a lot of uh, a lot of these quotations uh, would for them recall the texts, it would be easy for them to recall where, where the citation is located and so on. And so in the printed editions, when you're reading this, uh, it's, it doesn't hold your hand through it. Um, mm. They're like mnemonic devices that you would have exactly. in traditions as well. Like, Wasat Ata reminds you of something here and exactly. other things like that. Yeah. And so, uh, but to further advance in the research, you soon realize you need Arabic because <laughs> <laughs> these uh, a lot of these texts were translated from Christian Arabic sources. Um, and some would think that uh, immediately that it would have been from Coptic sources. That's not really the case. Beyond the uh, Coptic Gospel Katina, um, a lot of the Arabic sources come from the Church of the East. And I, I'm I'm getting ahead of the literature review also here, but um, it, it 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 comes from uh, uh, the the Church of the East, uh, which existed in places like Syria and Iraq now. Um, and sometimes the translations are direct and literal translations from Arabic and so on. And so you have these layers, and then you know at a certain point you need Greek and Hebrew. So you 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 um. You have these hurdles, which is why I think it took so long for uh, the academic uh, the sc scholarship on the Ethiopian Biblical Commentary Edition to begin because of these uh, layers that um, uh, are, are obstacles. Yes, who do we know that knows Greek, Amharic, Arabic, Hebrew, and all of this besides our good friend Mahari? <laughs> Nobody. So Cowley, uh, in beginning with the uh, literature review, then um, Cowley in uh, 1969. Uh, well, he uh, he didn't come to Ethiopia in 1969. He came to Ethiopia earlier. Uh, he was sent by the Anglican mission. He was a British uh, Orientalist. He studied uh, near e Eastern Christian uh, literatures, and when he was sent to the Beta Israel uh, as a uh, Christian missionary. Um, he uh, soon noticed that the Ethiopian church has a biblical commentary tradition and he says he kind of stumbled upon it and uh, it was like stumbling upon the entire Talmud at once. And so... That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, and given that he was an Orientalist and he knew uh, the, uh, these languages like uh, Syriac and uh, Greek... Uh, sorry, Syriac and Arabic uh, and, and so on. Um, 
he submitted a few articles in 1969 to a few uh, academic journals, and they were of uh, linguistic interest. Um, two articles he, he published in 1969. One was standardization, the standardiz standardization of um, Amharic spelling. And then uh, the other one was A and B verbal stem type. Uh, and he, in that article, he considers verbs and their germination patterns like mara, fajr, uh, and, and so on. Um, and so he's, he's, he's he, since I've, I've spent so much time reading Cowley, I kind of saw a pattern where, oh, he's interested in languages. He was interested in languages at first. And then he was interested and he was able to access the content. He was able to understand the content of the commentary tradition because he was a language person. And, and like, like we mentioned, the hurdles are, uh, uh, the, the, the linguistic hurdles are uh, formidable. And so it, uh, it's not surprising that someone that is that was so fixated on languages uh, like uh, you and Mahari <laughs> would that would develop an interest in the uh, commentary tradition. Um, he went from a linguistic concern in uh, for, in about 1971 to a biblical. You see, uh, you see this pattern where he's interested in biblical studies and. He said somewhere that he made sure that bef before teaching about the Bible to Ethiopians, he made sure to understand the uh, native biblical scholarship. And so he, um, a few times, uh, th there are accounts where Cowley is living among the uh the 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 Gubayat the, of uh, Masafabit, the uh, the schools of biblical interpretation. He's living among uh, student uh, the, the 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 teachers and the disciples, uh, and um, learning from them uh, in the standard way, uh, the traditional way. Uh, and in seventy one, seventy two, seventy three, seventy four, he publishes the groundwork for uh, future. Ethiopian Bibli scholarship and Ethiopian biblical commentary tradition. In 71, he published preliminary notes on the Bala Andim commentaries. He calls them the Bala Andim. And it's, I think maybe they that's what they were called, Bala Andim. We call them Andimta. At this point, they're understood as an Andimta. So the title is interesting, Bala Andim. So the commentaries that contain the Andims is was the title. Um, and he he shows the layout and the literary style of the corpus in this in, in the article preliminary notes on Bala Andim commentaries in 1971. And he describes the four fields of the commentary traditions. Um which you've listed already, right? New Testament, yeah. Old Testament, Patristic, and Monastic. Yes. And so he also he also describes the technical terms that the Andimta uses and um the contents of the introductory sections. In 72, um, his article, The Beginnings of the Andam Commentary Tradition, uh, are a comparative study on three manuscripts of um, Samuel, the book of Samuel. And um, he presents a theory, a literary theory here. Uh, and you see, he's, he's, he's thinking in terms of linguistics and he's thinking in terms of uh, uh, literature where he presents this theory about ma marginal uh, ma manuscript marginalia as the nucleus for uh, the commentary uh, corpus's de uh, development. And uh, he studies three manuscripts. Um, and in 73, his, his article in 1973, it was a study of Giz manuscripts in the Tigray province. So he was in Gondar, and then uh, he then publishes an article about manuscripts in the Tigray province. And I think that his interest in that developed out of the previous article, uh, the one I just mentioned in 72, because those manuscripts that he's studying, uh, if you look at them, they are from, all three of them are from the Tigray province, and he's tracing a um, the development uh, those uh, you know when they write critical editions, the uh, 
the diagrams they make of uh, manuscripts and sources. He's doing that. Uh, he's doing a source study, uh, and he's tracing the manuscripts in Tigray from uh, against the um, the crystallized tradition that's found in Gondar. And then in 73 and, also... And, and a brief note there, important for the audience to understand because, you know, there's a lot of politics associated with whenever you mention the, the provinces now. As far as I can see, there is no such thing as a Tigrinya commentary series, or at least no evidence of it. And I'm imagining these commentaries you're finding are in Amharic and in Ge'ez? Yes. Uh, the reason the commentary is in Amharic is because the uh, em the, the emperors of the uh, the, the Gondarin uh, uh, emperors after the destruction caused by Ahmed Garain, uh, they had summoned uh, the scholars of Ethiopia to Gondar in order to kind of uh, uh, recover from the destruction and. Uh, it's because the the language uh, of that place and time was Amharic, and so it's not it's not necessarily just uh, you know uh, the contribution of one ethnic group or whatever, uh, but it is uh, it was just the language of that of that place and time, and so uh, everyone came together and contributed in the the uh, church language, which was Giz, and the um, the language of the state, which was Amharic, and it was a collaborative effort from peoples of uh, uh, all over. It, it has nothing to do with ethnic uh, groups or anything like that. Yeah, and the point I was making was, for example, we have the same alphabet in use uh, with very few, you know, slight variations across Giz, Amharic, and Tigrinya. But as far as I can tell, and from whatever I've read from you, there wasn't like, for example, when they were called to the capital at Gondar, there wasn't such thing as a separate Tigrinya commentary tradition that they then translated into Amharic in order to present for the Gondarin kingdom. As far as I could tell, all of the manuscript evidence, as you said, whatever their ethnic ethnic background, whatever their provincial background, seems to be in Giz and in Amharic. Well, before that, it was just in Giz. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was just Giz, but you can tell the influence of the language uh, of the writer, it could be there could be a Tigring Tigringa influence on the Giz, or there can be an Amharic influence on the Giz. Uh, a slight there's slight details that will kind of give you um, uh, th that would give away the the writer's um, uh, uh, native language, but it's all in Giz. That's good. And so uh, going back to Cowley's works in 73, he also um, published uh, an uh, article called the List of Nicene Fathers in the Ethiopian Tradition. Uh, and then in 74, he uh, wrote an article called Old Testament Introduction in the Andam Ta Commentary Tradition, where he's focusing on the Old Testament commentary, tr commentary books, and he's looking at just the introduction introduction section because that is a whole theme within the Andamta uh, corpus is the is is the introduction sections um and then in that study he provides uh an english translation of uh what he calls the ancient teachings of ethiopia which was written by dika sultanat habta mariam uh, uh or abuna melkas edik uh and uh which describes the uh, traditional account of the Andamta's development, um, and it includes also a long uh, tradent of Memharan and uh, their successors. In 77, he publishes the New Testament analog to that, so a study on the introductory section of the New Testament um, uh, 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 commentary corpus. And, and he's doing all all of them, or just like a sampler of of a few here and a few there. Um, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, because um, I know I know Sister Peterson, who you mentioned earlier. I first thought it would be every song, but it seems to be 
a selection of about 12 that she chose and i'm i'm not sure about the particular order and i'm i know professor tadessa tambarath has written about that as well yeah um i i wouldn't be surprised looking back if he did um all of them or if he did a few uh and and uh just describe uh, just describing the style uh, of the introductory sections cuz they're all they're all uh, they're all the same what they do is they look at the context of the book the reason the book was written then the meaning behind the name of the author um and uh, so it shows that uh and this 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 style is uh still relevant now when studying the scriptures because uh, a, any good student of uh, biblical theology knows that the first part of the book is very important because it it lays out uh, the context and and uh, the direction of the rest of of the book, uh, and that's that's um, especially the case in in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, but especially in you see it in the Old Testament that if you understand what the uh, first part of the book, the intro, uh, or the first chapter is getting at, you have an idea of what the overarching uh, idea of the book is. Um, so in 77, uh, he publishes a uh, New Testament introduction in the Andamta commentary tradition. Um, so we just went over that. Um, and so in, in in 77, again, he comes back to a linguistic uh, interest. Um, he publishes an article called Additional Sources uh, of the Copula TT in Old Amharic. I, I'm, I'm, I didn't read that article. Uh, I, I, I figure it's about the Ch, the Ch. Um, so uh, additional sources on that. And then in the early 80s, he starts considering uh, biographical concerns because he notices that uh, the the uh, corpus names a few people and then just gives you no, no, uh, no nothing more. Um, Some crumbs. Yeah. So he publishes an article called Memhid S. Duros and his interpretations. And um, he hypothesizes that the that the um, that the textual traditions change in the 1800s, around the 1800s, because of the uh, work of a few gifted uh, memheran, and uh, this is very interesting because uh, uh, I, I've when when I read his theory on that, uh, it really uh, uh, it, it seemed like a, a solid framework, and you see that, um, like in, in the example of Memher Kifle Georgis, Memher Kidanwald Kifle, Memher Esdros, Memher Weldaab, you have between the 1700s and the uh, the late 1600s and like the 1900s, you have some of these. Memhran that are that stand out completely, and to simplify the matter, I would I would put them in a very small category, uh, opposed to the other large category of scholars that memorize the corpus and they're done. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Like which is the co which is the common pattern? They memor they 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 learn from the scholars. They memorize what they have to memorize. They teach, and the tradition keeps going. But then these small, um, gifted scholars, they do things that are radical. Uh, for example, we've talked about Memher Esteros on previous uh, on the previous um, installation of this program, where he seems to have well, he is the one that ha that revolutionized the commentary tradition uh, into what. Is now called the the, the lower house commentary, the Tachibit. and um, it's interesting because his inclinations are seen within the the literature itself methodologically, like it's there, and it's completely different from the Libet commentary, which uh, 
finally uh, in the 1800s disappeared uh, because of the dervishes. Um, it was already on the decline, uh, but uh, the, the, be, because of um, uh, uh, the, I think the final blow was uh, the killing of of uh, uh, one of the, the remaining Libate scholars and his disciples um, during uh, 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 the, the, uh, the the dervish skirmish in in, in the Gondar capital. Um, but uh, so moving on. Um, and, and as a refresher, before you move on, the the touch bit that survived is the is it is it's known for being briefer than the lie bit? That's the big thing that I I recall. Uh, uh, more refined, I wouldn't say briefer. More uh, refined, okay. more more refined, um, more stylized, uh, and the and critical of the biblical text itself, which is. The main thesis of of my work uh, mm -hmm. it's 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 showing that the the Tachibet commentary tradition is a text critical commentary tradition, um, which edited the text of scripture against ancient more ancient uh, manuscripts. The Libet did not do that, and wow. it's no and it's known its main difference uh, beyond being. Uh, more, beyond being more verbose and less refined is that it was not text critical of the text mm -hmm. um and uh i think we owe this completely to memher memher esdros which was again if we think of the two categories he's one of the gifted memheran uh maybe we have maybe five six names to those to that gifted group and then you have everybody else that keeps the commentary tradition going. And he seems to have not argued with anyone or caused any um, ruckus, but he completely revolutionized the uh, the tradition. And he he was of the view that the Giz texts of scripture were corrupted, um, and not corrupted in 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 the sense that they're misleading, uh, but that they need to be refined against more ancient manuscripts because uh, the Bible until very recently was not published by a uh, printing press. It was uh, it was the result of, of manuscript tradition. And uh, uh, so uh, and it was just a few months ago that our own synod finally did it in terms of the Giz, Old Testament and New Testament. People always ask me, Where's the English translation from the Giz? Look, bro, we didn't have the Giz translation of the Giz until literally just a few months ago. They published it together, Old and New Testament. Before that, I had to get, you know, Samantu Behero Orit, like the first eight books of the Bible, plus, uh, you know, Jubilees and Enoch on the back of a camel from Asmara to Addis Ababa in Mercato. And that's because of the, the presence of the Italian fascists that were in Eritrea and then the Catholic Church that came along with them, and, and they had a printing press, as you said, but, you know, this is still a very new thing. Yeah, and, and even in th with that being the case, the refined text of the Bible is that is that text which we find among the Andamta scholars. That's, that is uh, the, the cleanest, more, more re most refined um, uh, version. Um, I, I also think it's good when you bring up Memher Esteros for people asking, you know, how they should operate in the church. Let's say they're feeling some sense of isolation, some sense of being above their peers in some way. You have the one example of uh, Alak Agabrahanna, who causes a ruckus, to use your language, and is known for that. And he has his own contributions. But you have Memher Esteros, who I think is uh, less known by the general public certainly but may maybe the scholars do uh, are familiar with him but who's able to work in silence uh which i think is generally more your approach but ends up having this uh longer lasting impact our friend uh professor mahari pointed out to me that the um there's a certain uh 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 common uh phrase in amharic something about don't argue with fools just do your work. Uh, it, it's attributed to Memher Esdros, which wow. makes sense because he didn't argue with fools and he had a very uh, 
a radical view when you look at the view of his um of his peers that you know the the bible is perfect and it's literal etc that was the view of his of his peers also although the uh, the Leibniz scholars on record uh, have sa say that yeah there's an issue with with some parts of the text but we just ignore that they literally say that but Mehmed Esdros doesn't ignore that what he does is he goes to some place where there's a lot of bible manuscripts uh, uh particularly the Tana region and he spends the rest of his life uh editing the text against those looking for more ancient versions uh it, it, especially where the text doesn't make sense because of translators errors and the uh, i i have a, a quote from the Leibniz scholars where they say um the true reading of any part of scripture in giz is not really known because of scribal errors but they say they don't correct it which is okay maybe they didn't have the capacity member esdros had the capacity and he uh um, and the will and the will and and uh the Leibet commentary tradition is now extinct and the Tachbet, uh the labors of Memhir Esdros um has prevailed although his uh his uh, intellectual legacy has not prevailed uh, because you still have the tendency of just the narrow mindedness of the uh of the religious zealots of our culture uh and, and they're zealous and they're narrow minded, and that is not the legacy of uh, of Memir Esteros. Uh, although, you know, so, so it would do it would do well for for a lot a lot of um, a lot of them to consider the uh, intellectual um, heritage that they've received from Memir Esteros. It's because like the Libet is gone. It just it's extinct it does not exist there's there's some manuscripts out there uh that remain but uh attachment has prevailed um and so uh it's good to learn from your own history uh and uh do do better especially when you have uh th that example uh sitting right in front of you the whole corpus is text critical uh, and and again, uh, that is the main thesis of my research, and and I and I show that. Um, so we don't have to go into that too much in the literature review. Um, so you were on the biographical information that Kaldu began to look at. What's that? That you were looking at the biographical information such as this. I did. I did. Um, I look at the biographical information. I uh, look at the Ethiopian lore. I um, look at the biblical uh, literature. Um, I look at the uh, Cowley provided in his final work. We haven't gotten to it yet, but in his final work, Cowley provided two thematic studies uh, uh, from the Andamta uh, the, on the theme of creation and on the theme of uh, Christology. I studied the theme of suffering. And uh, so in line with Cowley, I, I, I engaged in um, biographical studies, uh, uh, historical uh, studies to a greater extent, um, and then just like Cowley thematic studies, uh, my, mine was um, on suffering, uh, and then I do uh, some manuscript studies where I, um, in in the um, from the gospel, I identify uh, a source from. Uh, uh, from uh, the 400s, uh, from the fifth century, uh, in in the Gospel Andamta commentary, uh, and so on. So, um, I try to continue exactly where Cowley uh, uh, left off. If that answers your question, it does. Yeah, uh, no, that's good. That's that's good. So he covered that we we had those four fields that we said right old testament new testament patristic and monastic did he uh i heard you say a couple of the old testament stuff and then themes did he do any of the patristic and the monastic stuff and or has anyone else uh, i have i i don't i don't see anywhere where cowley did uh a study on monastic stuff 
Uh, so I, I took Cowley's uh, theory of um, manuscript marginalia being the nucleus for the uh, commentary corpus. And uh, in that vein, uh, I did uh, a study on Marisak, uh, a chapter, a section of Marisak, and um, following the uh, uh, the commentary on that and the uh, variant readings on that. But I haven't seen any anywhere else where the uh, monastic texts are uh, addressed. Yeah, so as, as far as I know, then it's it's uh, Genesis, Psalms, Micah. Those are the critical. Those are the critical mm -hmm. editions. Mm -hmm. The critical editions. There are, um, and like I said, those are separate. Yeah, uh, separate. Separate. The one, so the, the one it sounds like from what I'm hearing you do, because I I made a little bit of a living as an interpreter as well. The one is kind of you know it's all intellectual work in a sense, but the one is more laborious. It's like uh, you know I've done. It's not data. Exactly it's data. Done, it's data mining. Yeah, is, I've done written. Important. I've done written translations versus like verbal. And I always feel that, you know, I've done like housing policy and healthcare stuff and that that stuff you're you're grinding through it to find the one one for one, you know, translations. But the verbal kind of takes more creativity. And maybe that's similar to uh, what you're saying as well Is there's a, a an extra intellectual contribution being made when you're critically thinking about the not just the differences in the grammar or in the spelling of the manuscript, which, as you said, has a place and a time, but having some larger kind of intellectual engagement with it. It's interesting that the way you talk about Cowley is is very respectful. And usually we don't think about that in terms of the Protestant church, but I think the Anglicans are very different amongst that. If you look at you know modern figures like Sebastian Brock and N.T. Wright, um older figures like c.s lewis i think uh even richard pankhurst the great ethiopianist uh these are figures that have come out of the anglican tradition and it's not as you said the masses uh to rely on the italian school of elite theory and political science it's become popular in tech spaces to talk about an 80 20 rule where you get you know 80 percent of your productivity out of like 20 percent of the people and the way you talk about it, it might even be less than 20%. You know, it might be uh, a few great men, like someone like Thomas uh, Carlyle and other people, historians talk about great man theory, where there's always a few individuals who kind of push things forward. And particularly with the discipleship that you said, our, 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 our society is, is highly anti-intellectual uh, and particularly the Christian tradition. Uh, these, uh, the, the, it's the zealots and the loud voices that 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 take uh, precedence, and so um, even for those that are inclined uh, towards uh, being different, uh, what the society does is it discourages that it um, condescends on them. Mini falasafa lumina lekat tamar nila lu yemil mahabra sabneyallo. So. Uh, you really have to not only have the capacity uh, to do these things, but you have to have the confidence and uh, the ability to um, overcome the tribulations that arise from there because you know you're going to uh, be outcasted uh, uh, from the day-to-day -day, uh, the norms of the society. You're not going to have people to talk to because people aren't concerned with what you're concerned with or um you know it's like uh you, you gave me an example i don't know if it's if it's okay to bring it up here but where uh you're learning chanting from a teacher of chanting and the teacher tells you uh something paradigmatically uh radical that has nothing to do with chanting like oh the angels spoke giz that was the first language giz was not the first language bro teach me chanting let me learn linguistic theory from someone else and uh you got to call a spade a spade uh i think uh in order to overcome these things if you're inclined to uh something different than the status quo in in, in our society you have to you, 
Mimin didn't know our Bamaringa, it's politically incorrect, but the Mitaru to Komat and Komat Ablokal Tabuya Milut and Agaral Gaptefata Fatali Bala, something like that. Other less so, um, these are a few. Uh, we have Memhere uh, Esteros. Uh, and we have the res by the way we have the response to Mehmed Esteros's call. He he called back his previous students. Um, so he retired. He taught most of his life. He retired, refined the Andamta tradition, called back his students to teach them the refined version. And their response was, uh, I, "It's not off on. It's on the tip of my tongue. I can't recall it, but they told him, uh, you know, basically." Go fly a kite, man. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, you, you know, you have that. You you see what the response, the societal response was to Memher Esteros. But um, even uh, from have, his own disciples. From his own disciples. Uh, and Memher Esteros, when you look at the um, the tradents of all the great teachers, he's in there. So he was a student of the uh, Old Testament, of the greatest scholars, also of the New Testament also of the patristic uh, uh, books, also of the monastic books. Anywhere where you oh, see right. the great teachers, he lived among them and learned among them. Uh, if we can trust the oral the oral recounting of these uh, tradents, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard sometimes to uh, rely on the oral tradition because um, even in my analysis, I found that the oral tradition is, uh, even when it's recounting history, it's off sometimes by 200, 300, 400 years. So, uh, you know, you just use it as like a guiding general compass when you're uh, looking at things, but you don't, cannot rely on the oral tradition. Uh, it's all over the place. But uh, going back to uh, the, the, the great teachers, you got at best five, right? Memher uh, Isdros, and then you have Memher Welda'ab, and I think this is chronolog chronologically too. And then you have Memher Kifle Georgis, and then you have Mem Memher Kidanawald Kifle. And those are those are those are the ones that really. Oh, Memher. Um, did I say uh, Weldab? I said Weldab. You have four. Mm -hmm. I can't give you can't give you more than. Um, yeah, four I know. I got this. Takla Weld was at least Kidanawald's student in terms of dictionary. I don't know if he had written anything biblical. But uh, in terms of preserving the the dictionaries, he was definitely his student. Um, basically, Cowley has shown more respect from the Protestant tradition to the Orthodox Christian tradition of any other Protestant scholar that I have ever heard of. And uh, in coming to Ethiopia, the way that you described that you want to know the, the native teaching. Aren't Anglicans uh, part of the apostolic tradition? Arguable. They're definitely Protestants because okay. of Henry VIII severing himself from the Pope so that he could get a divorce from a bishop that is friendly to him. Uh, and, you know, you could say they're halfway. Yeah, they're definitely, okay. I mean, they have bishops, they have uh, incense, they have liturgy, they have all those things that look like the other apostolic churches. But that's why I said it's always a few individuals. And what I was going to ask you was did he find any of the work? You know, disagreeable from his perspective, or did that bleed into his analysis? He of didn't. He was... didn't engage in in something as dumb as that. That's what makes it great. Also, he didn't project his European mind onto the work of the Ethiopians. So he's smart because the 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 the, the uh, um error of the European when studying the non-European is judging uh, and imposing the cultural trappings of the European on the non-European and speaking down to that work. When you do that, you fail. Because this is the subjective cultural um, work of a group of people which you do not understand. You cannot understand a group of people by just gazing upon them, right? Uh, and especially the Semitic people, which are uh, paradigmatically different from the European in, in their literature and uh, their way of thinking, their way of speaking um, is just fundamentally different. And so he didn't do that. So, uh, you know, and, and 
those that did, uh, their work is dated. Uh, like Sebastian Brock, his work was uh, elevated the Syriac, elevates the Syriac uh, uh, poetry and uh, hermeneutics to where it should be. It's, it's you know, this beautiful Semitic poetry. But those that came before him uh, were uh, n not only didn't have a good grasp of the, of the work, they spoke down. You see their racial uh, uh, biases there because they literally say it. They speak down uh, uh, to these ethnic groups. Uh, and so you see the, the colonizing mind of the European and, uh, and it's only a matter of time till that people start writing about their own history and then what you're saying uh, becomes irrelevant. There was, um, there are so many, uh, e even in Ethiopian studies, there's so many people that write so many things that uh, it shows how much they don't know, uh, especially scholars that um, uh, 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 are not familiar with the tradition and yet engage in scholarly work in the tradition. Uh, you see how many holes there are in their education and uh, you know, it's just a matter of time until people start writing their own history. And then you have these scholars at Oxford and Princeton and so on that are, or any other place. Um, I, <laughs> I wasn't like in intending to mention any people in particular when I named those places, but um, uh, you, have, you, you have people that will have dated themselves at a certain point because they will have shown that uh, what they're doing is imposing their um, their paradigms, their European views onto people that are not, that don't think like the European. And so Kelly didn't do that, just to, an just to answer your question, I went on a whole uh, broad discussion of that, but um, there's nowhere where Kelly did that, not once. I don't know, I was, I was curious because he handled his own biases by studying the corpus first, but I'm wondering if even checking his own biases, he he it bled through after the fact, but it sounds like it didn't. So I think this has been pretty good so far. But if there was anything else that we miss, obviously there there's stuff that we miss. Like they're gonna have to go buy the book when the book comes out. And this is just a preview, a gursha, as I always say. But if there's anything else substantively that you'd either like to introduce or round up on. And uh, if you could plug the uh, the journal that you and Mahari were just published in so people could go and see more of your work there as well. Yeah, the Alexandria School Journal. Um, we can um, maybe put the link for Amazon in the, in the video and um, they can uh, purchase that. I don't know, was there anything else that we left out? Um, no, uh, we didn't get to uh, Cowley's final works, but uh, just to summarize, um, he, all of his articles seem to have uh, developed into two final works, um, one on the Apocalypse of John, the commentary on the Apocalypse of John, uh, and uh, one uh, uh, which ended up being his PhD dissertation on Ethiopian biblical hermeneutics in general. And uh, that's where he provides to the two thematic studies that I uh, mentioned uh, on creation, which is be because that is a very common theme in uh, the Ethiopian biblical tradition, in the hagiographical writings, in the pseudo epigraphic writings, in the uh, monastic writings, in the liturgy, in the anaphora, the salvation history um, within the uh, anaphora, um, and uh, yep, that's uh, those are his two final works, and you see where all these linguistic and uh, literary interests uh, kind of condense into these uh, his uh, uh, magnum opus, particularly his PhD dissertation. Thank you. I hope through solidarity, we will unleash the spirit of creativity amongst whatever individuals are 
watching the show and are in our tradition so that they could also become students of this tradition in a modern way, the way you have. And if they have the, the time and the energy to go back home and to live amongst those people and, and pick up the traditional to, to blend. I think the only way forward is a blending of the tradition as well as the, you know, the modern, the present, the future. So thank you again for coming on the show. And we look forward to your book being published. Thanks for having me.